Wait. Just locks in. I had this strange feeling you wanted to talk, so I uh, I rang up. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you about this theory again. Again? How are you not done with this? Sun and Moon is out in like a week. Well, I kind of am. These are mostly just the uh, remnants of my notes, side points, and mini theories that may or may not help it all come together. Hmm. All right. Well then, get on Skype. Where should we start? Hmm. Starting, of course, with point one. AZ. A Grunt in the Delta episode mentions that the AZ in Project Azoth symbolizes the end. A to Z. The character Az, AZ, we know created the ultimate weapon that Project Azoth wants to use 3,000 years ago to absorb the life energy from thousands of Pokemon and resurrect his Floette. And perhaps inadvertently, he granted himself and his Floette immortality. Otherwise, how would they still be here 3,000 years later? And have you noticed how huge AZ is? Yeah, I've heard fans speculate it's just because he keeps growing with his immortality. But the human body mostly stops growing in our early to mid-twenties. There is a thing in various mythologies and, yes, also alchemic spiritism that explains this. AZ is enlightened, at least to some degree. He's a step closer to being a Nephilim, which in the Bible are described as very large humans, the offspring of humans and angels. But according to various teachings in spirit science and such, as we gain new heights of enlightenment, our bodies grow not only more perfectly, but also larger in size, though over the course of generations normally. In fact, some modern alchemists and, uh, hippies believe that this is why humans have slowly been getting bigger and bigger over the millenniums. Some even believe that the statues of especially large people in Egypt are life-size, and they were essentially the gods that gave the Egyptians their knowledge. But they weren't gods, they were just much more spiritually advanced beings. And of course, since gaining the power of the Azoth is also described as making you analogous to the mind of God, even gaining a bit of its power could make you much larger. And speaking of Nephilim and everything, in the Bible, Matthew 24 specifically, Jesus is explaining what the world will be like before Armageddon, specifically just before Armageddon. And he mentions that the world will be just like the time before the Great Flood in Noah's day, which is described as having Nephilim, hybrids, God needed to flood the earth to purify humankind's DNA, rid it of its demons, both literally and figuratively. And while Pokemon are not humans, in a world where a Pokemon is God, surely Pokemon are just as, if not more important than humans. So if Pokemon are being merged, becoming hybrids, maybe it's time to end it just like in Noah's day. And perhaps it's not even just Pokémon, but perhaps a merging of humans and Pokémon. Pokémon Mystery Dungeon is another universe where everyone is a Pokémon. Humans becoming Pokémon has been a thing since Gen 1, and in the recent Pokémon manga they used these very crystals to merge humans and Pokémon. And if the Ultra Beasts are angelic Pokémon, and Nephilim are humans merged with angels, Will there perhaps be a merging of human and Ultra Beast to symbolize this Noah-like apocalypse? Perhaps that's why the Ultra Beasts look like some of the humans, because they merged or are vessels for them. It's possible. And, you know, four islands in the middle of the ocean would be perfect to end in a Noah-like flood. Perhaps a figurative one, though, not literal. Plus, Noah's day was full of violence and people making their own gods. While still on the topic of the Bible, of course there are many different interpretations of the end times, and I was recently reminded of another very prominent one. Last video, I mentioned the interpretation that God will completely annihilate both heaven and the earth, and then recreate both only bringing along a chosen few to survive. But there is another interpretation of this, and that interpretation is that God literally brings heaven, brings the Aether universe to the Earth, merging them, and thus both are recreated anew, like a baptism. 
spiritually reborn. Okay, that is pretty interesting. What else? I really enjoyed that video you posted about how Zygarde will work, and it got me thinking about Zygarde again. First of all, that Zygarde cube, it's clearly not a cube. The actual name of the shape is a truncated octahedron, though clearly calling it a cube makes it much simpler for children. Anyway, it's a 3D shape made up of hexagons and squares, which is beautifully brilliant, because in sacred geometry, which is like numerology but with shapes instead of numbers, this shape combines the meaning of these two shapes. The hexagon symbolizes balance, order, and the spiritual powers, and the square represents the earth and all physical things within it. Balance and order of the earth, which is what Zygarde is. So again, Game Freak clearly has alchemy and mysticism in mind with the design of Pokemon as of late. Now then, I want to bring up an alternate interpretation of Zygarde's colors. Really? But that last one fits so well. True, but... So does this one. And I want to cover everything before laying this theory to rest. And this interpretation fits just as well, if not better than the previous one. They could either both be true, or just one of them. Either or. So first, looking at Zygarde, let's ignore the colors on his tendrils and look specifically at the gems, or cores, on Zygarde. Whenever has there been a set of five legendary Pokémon? None other than this one, spread across two games. Zygarde in the middle, and it, this beautifully links to alchemy. So in alchemy, the moon represents the feminine and the sun the masculine, which is why an eclipse is called celestial sex or an alchemic marriage. Also, this fits the version exclusive Ultra Beasts perfectly as well, ultimate masculine, ultimate feminine. Anyway, so taking this a step further, X and Y could represent the second chromosomes, the ones that determine your biological sex. X means female, Y means male. And these roles fit. As in every form of mysticism and mythology, the female represents life, creation, fertility, and the male is destruction, war, and so on. And if we look at the sides these legendaries are on, the directions they face, this works out too. The obviously male lion, which represents the sun, with the masculine powers, sticks with life, fertility, creation. Here we have a couple. And on the flip side, we have a somewhat feminine bat, which is the emissary of the moon, which is the feminine powers. The moon, of course, is also the gateway to the spirit world, the afterlife. And the male Y is death and destruction, which sends people's souls to the afterlife. So here we have another couple. And by the way, one couple are quadrupeds and the other couple can fly. Plus the green in the middle, Zygarde, Green in alchemy is the color used to represent sulfuric acid, which alchemists believed was the universal solvent, and all things can eventually be melted and merged with it. And plus, Zygarde has this form, which looks like a dog, and as previously established, each form is based somewhat on Norse mythology. And Skull and Hattie are two wolves in Norse mythology who are after the sun and moon to devour them consume them, and when you consume something, your stomach acids dissolve them. Considering the other Norse interpretations of X and Y, I think that may be very important. But back to these gems. In the middle is the pure white of all colors combined. Perfect balance, perfect order, perfect Zygarde, who could be seen as the Pokémon of Azoth. Life, death, order, evolution, the earth, the cosmos, a form of God's power. Because of these gems in its chest, it is all. And according to alchemy, when you align all five alchemical planets, along with the sun and soul and the moon and spirit, within a hermaphrodite body, which is both male and female, on the physical plane, you create perfect Azoth, or in this case, perfect Zygarde. And with the power of the Azoth, you have the power to destroy everything. Bring an end to everyone's story. X, Y, Z. These five Pokémon. Five is very important to alchemy, as there are three base ingredients plus lead plus spirit energy that make up the ingredients to make the Philosopher's Stone. The five-sided shape, a pentagon, is also the perfect shape for forming a Philosopher's Stone, which is why it's the dominant shape in the anime Full Metal Alchemist for the stone's transmutation circle. And just like in Full Metal Alchemist, we have a massively huge transmutation circle made by the bad guys to absorb the life energy 
from a massive amount of people. In Pokemon, Lysander was using two possessed Zygards to draw the circles with massive roots all around Lumino City while on top of the Prism Tower right in the middle. And as I've pointed out before, the Lumino City map, Philosopher's Stone Transmutation Circle. Could Pokemon have taken inspiration from Alchemy and Full Metal Alchemist? I mean, FMA is an extremely successful and popular anime. They very well could have. Pokemon has plenty of other references to other animes in it too. Google it. And plus, I mean, all of this alchemy stuff started with the question, why is Solgaleo a psychic steel lion with the full metal body ability? And why is it representing the sun? And then I, and so many others, started digging and began uncovering everything. True, so that inspiration is very possible, but here's a good question. If Solgaleo is the emissary of the sun, wouldn't it want to help the sun, not eat it? Well, have you looked at the sun and moon logos? Well, yeah. They both depict an eclipse, and remember, most ancient civilizations believed that an eclipse was a dragon or a demon of some sort devouring the sun much like the alchemical lion. And these logos hold many secrets, and let me spell them out for you. The sun logo is us looking up at a solar eclipse from the Earth. This little circle is the moon, and the sun is directly behind it, an eclipse. Meanwhile, the moon logo shows the same eclipse, but from an outside perspective. And in this negative space, this circle here is the moon, and the sun is over there, shining onto it. This white circle here is the Earth. And as you can see, the moon is blocking out the light from hitting this part of the Earth, meaning this part of the Earth is currently experiencing a solar eclipse. Though, this moon logo could be depicting a lunar eclipse instead. This is the sun, this is the big blue Earth, this is the moon. All three lined up. A lunar eclipse, Earth right in the middle. Remember how before we were talking about the biblical Armageddon and how Pokemon aligns somewhat nicely with it, and it speaks of a lunar and solar eclipse happening at the same time? But the thing is that, scientifically speaking, a solar and lunar eclipse can't happen at the same time. But sun and moon take place 12 hours apart. That's right! Which brings up the very likely possibility that these two games are parallel universes. Two worlds, flipped versions of each other. And the Ultra Beasts come from the Aether world in between them. <laughs> it's another possibility. Either way, these logos both show eclipses. So a Pokemon Eclipse version would be somewhat redundant. Yeah. And I like how you said version. What? What of it? Pokemon Black and White 2 were the last Pokemon games to use version in the title or subtitle. Ever since the beginning of the end, the beginning of the Zygarde era, the word version has been absent. Perhaps because it's all coming together. It's a step towards one game releases, or at least one final conclusive game before going back to dual games. By getting rid of the word version, they are saying that the games are no longer separate versions of each other, rather that they're either becoming closer to one solid game, or they are the same game in different universes. Jeez. Now for some quick points. Digimon is, or rather was, the main competitor to Pokemon, and it just finished its own reboot story arc, wherein every Digimon had its memory wiped and possibly was annihilated. It was even explained in the anime that they needed to reboot to save everyone because of complicated reasons. And also Yu-Gi-Oh, another major competitor to Pokemon, at least in the card game terms, is also going through a pseudo-reboot right now. They even revealed the new movie in the same style that Sun and Moon revealed itself. And they've said that the new movie is going back to Yu-Gi-Oh's origins, going back to the first generation of Yu-Gi-Oh and retelling the story but in a completely new and different way. So if Pokemon's competitors are doing it, maybe Pokemon is due. Eh, it's a minor point. Now back to the more mystical stuff. Cyrus's name in Japanese is Akagi which, as Bulbapedia points out, can mean Red Future, which could also be a reference to Planet X, also known as the Red Planet, Nibiru, Wormwood, Quetzalcoatl, and many more names. It's an apocalyptic conspiracy, namely a Gnostic Christian one, stating that during Armageddon or just before it, this Red Planet will show up 
mysteriously. Gen 4 remakes confirmed for Last Games Before Reboot? Another point, last time I mentioned that the Ultra Beasts could be the Seven Angels of Revelation, and because there are two UB-02s, that means in either Sun or Moon there are a total of seven Ultra Beasts. Or another way to look at it is that the first Ultra Beast is actually a homunculus, rather than a chimera like the other seven. But there is another interpretation, because it turns out there actually are eight angels in Revelation. The seven that sound the trumpets and pour the bowls that cause Armageddon, and the angel that guides Peter, which was the first of the angels in Revelation. And if UB-01 is Lily, who will join you and help you out along your journey, much like other companions in Pokemon's past, then in a way, she is a guide. She is being helpful. And the other seven Ultra Beasts are the ones bringing about the end. But what about the possibility that the other Ultra Beasts are version exclusive? Well, here's a possibility. In one version of Pokémon, you fight the Ultra Beasts that are actually, or at least resemble, Aether Foundation members, and in the other, those that resemble or actually are Team Skull members. Just like how in Ruby and Sapphire, you fight either Team Aqua or Team Magma, but both do exist and fight each other. The story of either version just focuses on one of them. Then Lily, being neutral on neither side, is in both. And possibly the last Ultra Beast you fight is also in both, to balance it out. I think that is very possible. But I also want again to look at the possibility that the Ultra Beasts actually aren't these human characters. What if instead they are all formless? like the description for UB-01 says, and coming from an Aether universe would mean that they technically don't have a physical form, and thus could choose any form they want. And so, they choose a look that looks similar to either the first person they see, or a person that they see as powerful, and are honorable, at least in some relatable way. The Ultra Beasts are vaguely angelic aliens coming because they sense that the end is near. Or perhaps they are the real bringers of the end, and the Aether Foundation alchemically summoned one for power, but when you take one, they all start coming. The Aether Foundation triggers the end. They pushed the final boundary of sin that humans had yet to push. They captured an Ultra Beast. And they tried to create their own god. Another thing that may be very minor, or admittedly completely wrong, this symbol has popped up twice in Pokemon now. First, it was the symbol for the XY Evolutions trading card game expansion, the big one that brings the card game back to Gen 1 after two parallel worlds came together. But just recently it's been revealed to also be the symbol of a particular Z-Stone. This one. I've asked around the Pokemon community and some people think that this is the Ice-type Z-Stone, and this symbol is a snowflake. And it could be, but there is also a Mew Z-Stone and a Lucario Z-Stone? The Mew one's definitely Mew, though. So I'm not sure if these Z-Stones are type-exclusive ones, or if these Z-Stones are unique ones for individual Pokémon. And it's just strange, because why would the Ice-type Z-Stone symbol be at the bottom of the Evolutions cards? Granted, the symbols are vaguely different, one has this horizontal line, but what's interesting is that both of these symbols are very, very similar to the Wicca symbol for the Triple Moon. Wicca, by the way, is also heavily related to ancient alchemy and such. And this Triple Moon symbol symbolizes a time where magic is at its most powerful. And if we replace magic with the power of a Pokémon, is that what a Z-move is? And isn't that what the Evolutions cards are doing? Taking the old, weak cards and remaking them to be their most powerful state? And Z-moves are a Pokémon using their most powerful powers? Though, I'll be honest, there's a good chance these symbols are in absolutely no relation, and there's a good chance that that particular bit, well, nothing will come of it. But there is one more point. Kind of a point I brought up before, but, but, Arceus. As I mentioned last time, Type Null is undoubtedly an attempt at creating Arceus. When it breaks free of its binding, it becomes Silvalli, and its hair bits fan out. Hmm. I am very positive that in the Gen 4 remakes, that will likely still be on the 3DS sometime into the Switch's lifespan, Black and White 2 did the same thing, Arceus will escape its own binding. The same symbol that was used to bind and control Dialga and Palkia. A broken version of it binds and controls Type Null, and this symbol is also around Arceus. 
the Pokemon God. Arceus likely put it there itself to make sure it doesn't accidentally destroy the universe with all its powers. Anyway, according to the Pokedex, Arceus created the universe with its 1,000 arms. I've previously, as in years ago and then recently remade it, theorized that these arms are actually armaments. And these armaments are the unknown. Arceus used a thousand unknown to create the universe. But now I'm thinking, what if the Pokedex is literal? Thousand arms. What if this ring binding Arceus is holding in its thousand spiritual and or literal arms? What if they are spiritual and physical, because that's what the Arceus in alchemy does. It's the border between spiritual and physical things in the universe. So what if Arceus breaks out of its binding in the Gen 4 remakes, just as Type Null does now? What if the story of Sun and Moon doesn't come to a complete end, just like in X and Y, but then in the Delta episode that they added to Oraz helps explain a bit more of X and Y's story? What if the post-game story of the Gen 4 remakes causes Arceus to break free, release its thousand arms as primal Arceus, and recreate the universe? Or even just make a new universe for the next game. <laughs> Having a thousand arms, that would make Arceus like... some sort of space god octopus. The one survivor from the previous universe in Hawaiian mythology. <laughs> no, no, no. That would be too perfect. <sighs> and you know what, Toby? As all of this information has been coming out, I'm thinking less and less about the accuracy of this reboot theory. But believe me, I still have a feeling that something big, some major change, is happening to Pokémon during or after Generation 7. But maybe it's not a total rebooted change of anything. I mean, Black and White was already a very soft reboot, and Sun and Moon have already become a much, much harder reboot, though it's still soft. But now I'm thinking, it will still reboot, but not in the way I originally thought when I made that first video. They aren't going to get rid of everything, nor will they totally abandon the turn-based genre. But what if all of this is simply pointing towards some big, inevitable change. Core Pokemon games on console. The handheld world and the console world are coming together with the Nintendo Switch, previously known as the NX. And Pokemon is confirmed to be in its sights. So you know what I'm thinking. I'm thinking the Gen 4 remakes will still be on the 3DS, even with the Switch already out. I mean, Pokemon Black and White 2 did the same thing. They came out on the DS a good year, over a year into the 3DS's life. They can do that again. Game Freak likes making games for a system that already has a huge user base, which is why they stuck with the DS back then. The 3DS didn't have a great start. And following that climactic remake of Gen 4 that would be a signal of the end, they then make their kind of a reboot, but not really, game on the Switch. Being on console without all the limitations of a handheld will give Pokemon a reboot harder than Black and White's and Sun and Moon's combined, though still not a total change. Just as the octopus survives the Hawaiian creation myth, and just as many elements from Asgard survive Ragnarok, and a select number of humans are spared in Armageddon, the core of Pokemon will remain. It's only what surrounds it that will be totally new. And you know, I think that's beautiful in its own way. Yeah! And you know what else? A big problem with game theories as a whole is that most of them can't be proven. There's no litmus test. There's no scientific method. Which is why the joke is, it's not a game theory, it's a game hypothesis. But I think this particular theory actually is a theory, because I'm looking at the past of Pokémon and predicting the future, and even if what I predict doesn't happen exactly as I predicted it, as long as it somewhat does, that means I was at least on the right track, and that possibility excites me. And so, as the theory goes, I speculate not a remake of Gen 1 per se, but a sequel. Pokémon 2. Based decades after the events of Red and Blue with a much more massive world to explore. Pokemon isn't ending, it's evolving, entering a new era. It's finally finished a massive story arc that has spanned 
20 plus years. And this new era that it'll be entering is, from the perspective of many, exactly what Ragnarok and M Armageddon are. Not so much an end as much as just a new beginning. Well, Sun and Moon are right around the corner. How many dots have I truly connected, and how many were mere coincidences? That I do not know, but the next time we speak, Toby, part four, it will be plenty after Sun and Moon has come out. And then we can discuss even more of this theory, as well as what I've gotten right and what I've gotten wrong, and it'll be fun. Oh, you just want to gloat about what you got right. Well, I'd be lying if I said no to that, but I've already had a few points disproven. Thankfully, nothing that debunks the theory as a whole, but, you know, plenty of... A lot of minor stuff here and there. Well, either way, I look forward to it then. I'll talk to you later. Bye, Toby. <sighs> it's finally almost over. Many months, 800 hours. <laughs> this project. Hey, you know what, bud? I've had enough of this. You seriously think Nintendo and Game Freak are dumb enough to reboot? This whole theory has been a waste of your time. Are you a manifestation of the more cynical side of my subconscious? Uh, yeah, good job, Snorlax. And thanks to all your research into this alchemy and spirit mind BS, your subconscious learned how to finally push itself out. Albeit slowly, I can only just now talk. But how do you talk if you have no jaw? I don't know, maybe it has something to do with the fact that I'm a cartoon character on your computer screen. And your poor acting irritates me. It's painful to watch, so mark my words. The next time you hear from me, I'll be debunking this theory of yours. <laughs> After all, as a part of your own mind, I know every little hole in this theory. And none of them are as tight as you'd like them to be. Especially not once I'm done ravaging them. So bye. I think that guy has a bone to pick with me. this strange feeling you wanted to talk, so I, uh, I rang up. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you about this theory again. Again? How are you not done with this? Sun and Moon is out in like a week. Well, I kind of am. These are mostly just the uh, remnants of my notes, side points and mini theories that may or may not help it all come together. Hmm, all right. Well then, get on Skype. Where should we start? Hmm. Starting, of course, with point one. AZ. A Grunt in the Delta episode mentions that the AZ in Project Azoth symbolizes the end. A to Z. The character Az, AZ, we know created the ultimate weapon that Project Azoth wants to use, 3,000 not only more perfectly, but also larger in size. Though, over the course of generations normally. In fact, some modern alchemists and, uh, hippies believe that this is why humans have slowly been getting bigger and bigger over the millenniums. Some even believe that the statues of especially large people in Egypt are life-size, and they were essentially the gods that gave the Egyptians their knowledge. But they weren't gods, they were just much more spiritually advanced beings. And of course, since gaining the power of the Azoth is also described as making you analogous to the mind of God, even gaining a bit of its power could make you much larger. And speaking of Nephilim and everything, in the Bible, Matthew 24 specifically, Jesus is explaining what the world will be like before Armageddon, specifically just before Armageddon. And he mentions that the world will be just like the time before angels. Will there perhaps be a merging of human and ultra beast to symbolize this Noah-like apocalypse? Perhaps that's why the Ultra Beasts look like some of the humans, because they merged or are vessels for them. It's possible. And, you know, four islands in the middle of the ocean would be perfect to end in a Noah-like flood. Perhaps a figurative one, though, not literal. Plus, Noah's day was full of violence and 
people making their own gods. While still on the topic of the Bible, of course there are many different interpretations of the end times, and I was recently reminded of another very prominent one. Last video, I mentioned the interpretation that God will completely annihilate both heaven and the earth, and then recreate both only bringing along a chosen few to survive. But there is another interpretation of this, and that interpretation is that God literally or the Great Flood in Noah's day, which is described as having Nephilim, hybrids. God needed to flood the earth to purify humankind's DNA, rid it of its demons, both literally and figuratively. And while Pokemon are not humans, in a world where a Pokemon is God, surely Pokemon are just as, if not more important than humans. So if Pokemon are being merged, becoming hybrids, maybe it's time to end it just like in Noah's day. And perhaps it's not even just Pokemon, but perhaps a merging of humans and Pokemon. Pokemon Mystery Dungeon is another universe where everyone is a Pokemon. Humans becoming Pokemon has been a thing since Gen 1, and in the recent Pokemon manga they used these very crystals to merge humans and Pokemon. And if the Ultra Beasts are angelic Pokemon, and Nephilim are humans merged with a thousand years ago to absorb the life energy from thousands of Pokemon and resurrect his Floette, and perhaps inadvertently, he granted himself and his Floette immortality. Otherwise, how would they still be here 3,000 years later? And have you noticed how huge AZ is? Yeah, I've heard fans speculate it's just because he keeps growing with his immortality. But the human body mostly stops growing in our early to mid-twenties. There is a thing in various mythologies and, yes, also alchemic spiritism that explains this. AZ is enlightened, at least to some degree. He's a step closer to being a Nephilim, which in the Bible are described as very large humans, the offspring of humans and angels. But according to various teachings in spirit science and such, as we gain new heights of enlightenment, our bodies grow not